up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Cheeky Midweeky, where we are making strength and conditioning not boring anymore. And today we have another former athlete of mine, Tyler Kluver, on the show. Kluver, thanks for joining, brother. Of course. It's good to see you, man. Been, been a while. Too. And uh, anybody listening, Kluver is not only a former athlete of mine, but it's been pretty awesome to see what you've done in terms of the show with Washed Up Walk-Ons. So anybody that's not in Iowa, he has a podcast. He created a brand got super strong, super fit. So shout out to you for all of that. What drove you to do all of that? Oh, that's a good question. I, it's funny. I re, I, I'm, I'm a heady guy. So for those listening, I was a long snapper, which uh, specialists are a little bit uh, mental. It's, it's a mental game. 90% of it, especially at the you were also it. dealt a really hard deck coming in after Casey Kreider because Casey Kreider is the freaking man. Yeah. Yeah. Much more of the man than me. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I, my life has been really good as far as like successes wise. Like I've, I think about this a lot, like, because I do a lot of listening to podcasts and like, you know, the self, I, you know, I listen to Huberman and all these people, like all these people trying to make their life better and, Obviously, with a fitness twist, strength conditioning twist, because that's what I'm into. And like a lot of these people that are successful are, they have this like trauma that happened to them or uh, some like deep driving motivation. And I think back in my previous 28, 29 years of life, and I was just like, I just don't have that really. So I don't know what really has landed me here, why. I've been somewhat successful with entrepreneurship and running a couple of my own businesses. And, um, even before that, like just as a division one athlete. Um, but like, I think certainly once I got to college and I realized that coming out of high school as a linebacker who was pretty good at football and then realizing that stepping into that locker room was like, Oh, I'm the, I'm the fattest, slowest dude here. That like provided a lot of motivation because a lot of my own self worth starting my senior year of senior spring of of uh, high school was like fitness is my thing. Like I like really? fitness. I found CrossFit in 2012. Like the first videos I ever saw of CrossFit were in on YouTube in 2012, and I started doing that before I I went to Iowa. It's a big part of what I do now. And so like fitness and health has been sort of my deal for the last 11 years, 12 years. And then I went and I was in an environment every day where, um, like I wasn't, I was the least fit guy in the locker room. Um, and for a lot of the time I was like the least healthy as well. Like when it came to like, like I ate like crap. Yeah. I, um, I was holding like a body fat percentage that was okay. But if I would have like known what I know now, like I just could have been so much different. And so a lot of 35 back in the day, what are you right now? I weigh 195. Oh my God. Um, yeah. And I, I, my top weight when I was trying to train for pro day was 243 and I played more like in the two low two twenties. So, um, yeah, it's just like, I don't know. I've just, I, I, I was around a lot of elite people and, you know, the whole, uh, the cliche, like you are the average of the five people you spend your most time with. And I think that's like very true. And I don't really have a lot of friends now that I hang out with and do like, I'm very, I sit in this basement and podcast for a living and like coach clients that I never see. So like the five people that I hang out with the most with or, or have conversations with are still my roommates and teammates from college who are all like very high achievers to still playing in the NFL. Um, Drake is another story. Uh, Kevin is like extremely successful in sales and like as an athlete in his own right. And then Bo same way. So I just like, I can't be the worst. Right. So there's just like that driving motivation. And, uh, and yeah, coach Doyle told me that he, I'm the only 21 year old uh, he's ever seen that still had baby fat too one time. So um, as far as my own like personal aesthetic goals and like, my, my own fitness after college, uh, like my inability to like keep up with the rest of everybody else was certainly a driver in college too. 
you're almost like the lineman because as a former lineman myself, weighing 300 pounds, like the minute you're done playing, you're like, I got to get rid of all this. And I like, look at Levi and Landon Paulson right now. Yeah. Yeah. They've done impressive body, uh, body weight losses themselves, especially coming from like 315, 320, um, sloppy 315s too. They weren't like Brandon the Sheriff. To tell you they weren't too. Brandon Sheriff 315s. Um, yeah, like it's, it wasn't a thing. It, the body weight loss. So I could have lost weight. Like I'm very exercise science is my, uh, my degree. So I'm aware and I, I know how to manipulate nutrition and, and training to get what I want as far as like performance and body goals. So that, and, and I'm, I coach it. So I have a very thorough understanding of that. So it wasn't necessarily such like a, I have to drop this weight. It was more of, I got out of college we had a goal body weight in college that we had to stay around and I was able to finally live at the weight that I wanted to and sort of eat the diet that I wanted to, that was, um, beneficial for those goals. And so I started doing that and this is the result of that. Like when I was able to go off on my own and kind of do my own thing, I no longer needed to be heavier to kind of mess around with like, legitimate D one linebackers and safeties and all that on, on punt and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, it was a byproduct of just like finally getting to like have my own goals and nutrition. Now I know Kevin had interned in the weight room. Did you ever toy around with that? Have any thoughts about it? And if yay, nay, like what was the driving force to or not to? So I thought when I found CrossFit in 2012, that like, Going into college, I was going to get an exercise science degree. Like, great. That was going to guide my my education. And then I didn't really need that. I was basically going to, like, go own my own CrossFit gym, right, within the strength conditioning context. I was somewhat interested in the, like, strength coach profession. Obviously, getting to be around guys like you and DeMarco and Weissman and, and all that has was, like, great. And I wanted to – I, like, kept my – a toe in the water, we'll say just mentally, like, eh, that's always an option. But I also knew that if I was going to coach, it was going to mean probably moving around. Mm. And especially if you stay in it for a really long time and you work your way up the ranks and it's not, you know, it, it happens with strength coaches, but also a lot more just like with general football coaches, like, you're just moving around a lot and like taking a new job, always trying to find the, the next best position, the next step up. And I didn't, I valued, I was, I was already uh, engaged by the time I left college. Um, so I valued sort of the life that was already starting to like plant itself here in Des Moines. Um, and what I thought I could possibly do in Des Moines more than the opportunity to like possibly go around and be a strength coach. I also like was still going to pursue the CrossFit thing. And so uh, I don't think there's very many coaches out there who are like, yeah, I'm a strength and conditioning coach for the whatever football team. And I also own my own CrossFit gym. So those are just going to be com competing um, ventures. And so I just, yeah, I never, it, I never really pursued it. I never did the, the uh the intern like kevin did or anything like that so yeah we kind of put that to bed pretty early kudos to you for realizing that though and i think you're gonna reign true with a lot of our listeners out there because they do want that they want that unicorn situation like what happened at iowa right like doyle being there for as long as he is ray yeah. being there as long as he is now coach ferentz there as long as he is DeMarco starting on that path at Elon. Like he has yeah. no plan to leave and no real reason to. And when you see what can get built and the benefit for the athletes, the coaches, the families, like that's what everybody's chasing right now. Yeah. I, DeMarco is a, I think a good example of like what I probably would have wanted that path to look like if I went down it. He took over at Elon, what, like in his late 20s, basically, 27, 28? It was like 25 because it was the middle – it was March of 2018. Wow. So, yeah, I mean – and and DeMarco, obviously – and here's the thing, too. Like I would have had to believe in myself. That, 
I was already behind DeMarco, right? Like DeMarco was like coaching while he was playing. That's one of yeah, my favorite right. stories yeah. from so Nick. He was ahead of everybody. He was literally like co- that, coaching like... his teammates in the weight room as like the coaches were like gone. So can you believe that? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great story. Um, so, you know, like. What's up, strength coaches? Want to take a quick break from the show to talk to you about our sponsor, Team Builder. Team Builder is your one-stop shop for online training platform needs as a coach. With Team Builder, you're going to be able to program for your athletes, whether they're in person or remote. Using Team Builder, not only will you be able to program for your athletes, but there are special features such as the leaderboard and locking training with wellness questionnaires. With the leaderboard, you can have an exercise performed that day, whether it be a lift, a sprint, or a jump, and scores can be updated in real time and projected on a TV in the training. Wellness questionnaires can be used at the beginning of training, and your athletes will have to fill them out prior to being able to train. This ensures that as a coach, you're being able to collect quality data before the athletes train. So, if you're interested in Team Builder, click the link down below and find out more information let's get back to the show i would have had to go and get the the cert the right certifications and um and then get into a job and those entry-level jobs is, i get being at iowa would have helped me a lot i would have been able to like if i wanted to i i think about it if i wanted to like i could probably be an assistant at iowa right now um if i would have taken that path six years ago seven years ago um, I could have worked my way up into assistant role at Iowa, probably with that connection, being a, a former player. I'm confident in my knowledge in the space, especially if I would have kept diving deeper into the college strength conditioning space. And then, yeah, I probably could have proven that I could run a, a program like Elon somewhere across the country and, and like done that. And I've talked to Nick about it and he's like, yeah, like the, the pay is good. Like uh, there's not a lot of reason to leave. I have a lot of control here. That would have been the ideal situation, um, but that's not the route we went. Yeah, they're just few and far between. Like he's yeah. again the unicorn. But with, yeah, it's, you know it's I mean? not – everybody wants that, right? And it's – not everybody's going to find it. You know, if you ever do want to get back into it though, the guy who was the head strength coach at the Baltimore Ravens, um, he got – let go again, like talking about it, but he was in a private sector place for a while. And then Harbs knew him personally and then brought him in. I don't think he had very much uh, NFL experience prior to that. He had owned his own gym. So you never know. The Hawkeyes might come calling for you in like 10, 15 years. (laughs) Yeah, they might. It's funny. Somebody like, uh, you know, LeVar just, it came out that he interviewed with the the Buccaneers for the special teams job. Oh, okay. And uh, I got a couple of people on Twitter, like chirping me, like, should you like, should you apply for that special teams position? I'm like special teams coach. Like that's the thing. Here's the, the other side of this is, and I strength conditioning is a little bit different, but my dad was a coach and my football dad, other sport, football and basketball. Okay. And, uh, and he was, so he's my coach for AU basketball, starting in third grade, all the way through freshman year. He was a freshman coach for the high school. He was the O line coach for the varsity football team at, in high school. So he was my coach for 10 years and uh, he was a lot like Doyle, which is why I think, gosh, even from a physical, like actual capability standpoint, I was able to like succeed through the Doyle program at Iowa. And like, I also had another coach that was like that um, in AU basketball over the years, just like old school, hard like hard on you a lot of probably unnecessary yelling and like things that didn't make a lot of sense and practices were hard and everything was hard and it was just like it really grinded out like if you were gonna make it you were gonna be proven you were gonna go through the ringer um so i think that's partially why i succeeded at, at iowa in that program but through that i also saw And there was some other factors to this now that I'm an adult and I can look back, but I saw what coaching stress wise did to my dad. Uh And I saw what coaching did stress wise to the coaches at Iowa. Like we talk about it all the time. Like it's the worst profession as a division one football coach. Like they don't leave the building ever. And you guys were there at four in the morning and there all day. It's like, there's not a lot. The number one thing I value, and I'm fortunate that I've found this early on and I've kept it as a priority is like, I value working minimally as efficient as I can to make the amount of money that I need to sustain the life I want to live. And past that, I do not care. 
I don't care. I will work within that necessary work window each day to like be very intentional and get a lot done. And I've been able to do a lot through that, but I value time with my wife and now my kid uh, more than anything. So if I can work 20 hours a week, then I'm going to work 20 hours a week and I'm going to spend my twenties and my thirties, not working 60 or 70 hours a week. Sure. In 40 years, could I have all this money in the bank? Yeah. But like, I'm also pretty smart and well, uh, into like investing knowledge and like, I'll be okay financially in, in 20 years. In four that's really years. smart of you to think that because there are some coaches that listen to this that that's not their reality and that's something that we talk about the four p's here at strength coach network pay progression sense of purpose and personal life and those four things are going to help you dictate the job that you get and you know something you might not have realized as a player for us it was actually really good because unless we had coverage that day doyle was awesome about being like don't guard your desk like as long as you got your job done right and you had things done because we'd leave to go play noon hoops on tuesday thursday with yeah. people at carver or if we had something to do like shit we'd leave at three and come back for food at four thirty. that's true i mean that's the one thing that i guess as a player i i subconsciously i kind of you're probably viewed, like they're just there forever yeah i just viewed you guys just being <laughs> in there all day just, nick just reading books with huge words and it's just like now we did do that that yeah. like that was because you talk about competitiveness within right. your five group of people think about like that room i mean at one point it was weissman demarco joel cody and myself yeah. so it was like oh you're gonna read a book a month i'm gonna read a book every two weeks like right. forget you yeah and but yeah th- it's that's the other thing, and that's honest. It's, it's part of why I'm not down the road now at 29 years old, going to be 30 this year. I'm not owning a CrossFit gym, is because I realized if you're going to own a CrossFit gym, or even if you're going to be the head coach at a CrossFit gym or a private strength conditioning facility, whatever that may be, you're going to be training people who are either kids who have school or are adults who have jobs, of which happen during the normal work hours. So you're now working four or five in the morning to seven or eight, and then you're just chilling during the day. And then you're working again, probably at four to six at night, four to seven at night, depending on what it is. Those are the hours. Those three days before the workday and after the workday are like when you're going to be training those people. And I dabbled with that a little bit. I had a, I coached at a CrossFit gym. Then I had another coaching job here to just like a general, like group fitness uh, facility um, where we did personal training too. And I was, it was okay. It was back before I had a kid definitely would have hated it a lot more now. Um, but I, I put in a little bit of time, uh, of, of those like sweat equity hours, like waking up three 30, opening the gym, running a four, a five, a six, seven, eight, nine clap, six classes in a row. Um, and that being like the morning shift, if you're, if you're on the morning that day. So I've done a little bit of that. But it's just like, you know, I do, that's not for me. What is something that a lot of strength coaches don't, or even athletic trainers that don't understand about CrossFit? Because I feel like when it first came out, everybody was just hating on CrossFit. What is so misunderstood and what can be like applicably taken from it? Uh, yeah, the biggest thing is I'm so glad that I'm on this podcast now and not like 23 because it would have been like a very much more bro answer. So I want to, I want to hear the bro answer now. Yeah, in, in addition. You don't want to hear the bro answer. I probably still sound like a bro to a lot of people, but I hope that, uh, I haven't been on a podcast in a while as the guest. So I hope I sound a lot more intellectual than I, than I used to. So CrossFit's biggest mi- misconception is that the sport gets misconstrued with the methodology. So here's, here's what that looks like. What most people see when they see CrossFit is they see what's on ESPN or, or CBS or whatever you know, whoever aired it most recently and they see the very, very tip of the, of the spear. It is the ultimate expression of what, if you somehow as a 20 to 30 year old human who decides I want to be a fitness athlete and I don't need a job, somehow your income is covered or you have sponsors or something like that. People are seeing what's possible for people who train I mean, these guys, these professionals are literally in the gym six, seven, eight hours a day. They're not training that much, but they're sitting there because they, in in another 20 or 30 minutes, they're going to pick something up. They're going to do, they're going to work on something else. You know, they're doing like five, six, seven pieces a day. 
so it's like that's what you see and it's it's fun it's competitive it, they have made it a competition and that's what draws people in that's what's exciting and entertaining but that is not crossfit that is the sport of crossfit if you walk into your everyday crossfit gym of which is called a box and there's a lot of things about crossfit that's like it's just like you're doing it to yourself, you know? So there's, you know, the lingo, AMRAPs and EMOMs and the box and, you know, whatever. If you walk into your CrossFit gym down the street, 99% of what you're going to see is like middle-aged people like finding full squat depth for the first time and like having thoracic mobility because they've worked on like pressing movements and um, like getting their first box jump on like a six inch box, like legitimately middle-aged people who haven't done anything with their fitness or health for the last 15 or 20 years or whatever it may be. And they come in and they start doing some cardio fitness and like in two or three months, their, their resting blood glucose is down. Like it's, it's literally, it's, it's completely different. And then there's the guy in the corner, like me, who's like trying to do like a 30 minute snatch workout uh, you know, with like, that works up to like 275 and you're like, why is, what is this guy doing? Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's the fact that the methodology, which is constantly varied functional movement done at high intensity is taken to the extreme and people only see the extreme, but most of the time it's just people getting healthy and like doing functional fitness. You know, now, I feel like the biggest knock that strength coaches or athletic trainers hear is like, oh, well, you got grandma over there deadlifting or doing clean and jerks. Yeah. Like, is that is that the case or what? Yeah, it is the case. Uh, but it's only the case if they are run through the correct. So, oh, I'm really, I'm, I'm like a, the CrossFit, uh, I'm like flying the CrossFit flag on this podcast right now. It's fine. I, we, I hope like, I do. It, I mean, we know like our coaches out there have athletes that do this stuff. So this is good for them to know. Yeah. So I, I, I hope I get this right. It's something like, um, technique, then volume, then intensity or something like that. I'm probably butchering that, but the idea behind it is you don't do anything until you can do it well. And that's unloaded. Right. So if it's a deadlift or whatever, they're pulling a PVC pipe. Like they're literally going through the movement pattern with no weight. And until they can do that well, then you're not going to add reps or load or whatever that may be. And then once you do add reps and load, you, you continue to make sure that the, the technique and all of that stays correct. Taking a quick break from the show to talk to you about our newest sponsor, Hawken Dynamics. Hawken Dynamics builds and designs software and hardware for coaches, athletic trainers, sports scientists, and everybody in the high performance department. Most notably, their use of their force plates with the ease of transportation and ease of use. Not only did I use them when I was at Towson, but I've used them when I've moved back here to Iowa with Tucker at Goldfinch. So check out Hawken Dynamics in the link down below. Now let's get back to the show. And then you can add intensity last, right? So now maybe we're doing it for time. And as long as you're still doing it correctly for t uh, in that timed interval, then go for it. Like, you know, like it, it catches a bad rap. And obviously there's tons of poor examples of where people do get out of the, and that's where a lot of people, that's where a lot of the hate on CrossFit comes from too, is because in the sports side of things, when you have these elite athletes who are just like, the stuff that they do is absurd and the fitness that they have is absurd and the time in the game that they have is so much that they can move poorly and still be okay like they can round their back a little bit on a set of like 15 or 20 deadlifts in a timed workout and it's not going to hurt them the problem is is when people conflate that with oh this is what the goal is like this is what they're teaching it's like uh, no you're you're seeing you're for seeing example, a, somebody doing an offensive lineman making yes. a block with bad technique. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That's so not you're, what they see, practice. you're yeah. seeing someone dive at ankles as they as somebody's running for the end zone because they have to, yeah. right? Of course, you'd love to form tackle that guy hip to hip, run your feet. But in the heat of the moment, it's competition. You're you're shoestring tackling a guy like that's what you got to do. What it is, so the competition gets conflated, and. Uh, and yeah, like grandma is deadlifting because deadlifting is functional, right? Like what if, what if grandma lives on her own someday and she needs to pick the laundry basket up off the floor, yeah. do her laundry, 
Like that's a deadlift. And that often is what you'll see replicated in the gym for grandma. She's not going to load 225 up on the bar. If she was like, serious, she would. Yeah, I mean, if she wasn't <laughs> soft. But, you know, like she's going to start where it's like it's the bar and they put like two boxes down or like, a, you know, some um, some jerk blocks that she can pull from like a normal height. She's going to deadlift like 35 pounds or maybe even less to begin with. And it's gonna, it's it's infinitely scalable and – that's what people don't see most of the time is is a lot of these things are scaled down so that people aren't doing dumb weights or dumb amount of reps. Like that's what, what would you recommend to any of our listeners that might be strength coaches that have their athletes double dipping and like doing a team workout and then later in the day in the off season, maybe doing something CrossFit related. How would you go about handling that? And what's your recommendation? Yeah, it's a good question. I think a lot of it boils down to like what that team workout looks like. Um, like athletes are going to, and I find this out with myself a lot right now because I push the absolute limit on like training, um, still to this day. And the athlete, some athletes can, can manage a lot of load, like a lot of volume of training and some can't. And so first of all, you have to know your athletes, but second, like, Man, I, I would almost even argue against it. I would say like, don't, unless it's skill focused, like there should not be a lot of heavy, like heavy loading or a ton of like uh, central nervous system overstimulation when it comes to like conditioning type stuff. If you want to do like skill, um, skill stuff, uh, position specific stuff and double dip with those kinds of things, it's, it's usually better. But I would really stay away from like, you know, you do a big team workout where you got a big squat day and now this now this kid's going to do like a CrossFit class where they're going to do like 150 of some like Olympic move. Like it's just not safe to, to put somebody um, under the like you, you wouldn't you wouldn't suggest that. But um, I would say like manage the intensity and, and focus of those two sessions and make sure they're not the same thing. Like shouldn't be doing strength and then strength. Right. Or, or like conditioning and then conditioning, make sure it's like a conditioning or skill or something like that. Yeah. We've had coaches talk about like, Hey, I, you know, what, what would you advise the people? Because that's, that's happening because sometimes even the position coach are like, Oh, you got to do more. You got to do more. You know, the off season's coming up in season, like spring ball. That's something that we've talked about in strength coach network before about like, Oh man, if we could get rid of spring ball as strength coaches, I'm sure as an athlete, you would have wanted to get rid of it. Yeah. Spring ball. Yeah, that was tough because we were still lifting hard during spring ball. Like, yeah. Monday, we, uh, not Monday, as Tuesday, hard as Monday, those. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday lift, yeah, or practice. Yeah, so, you know, not as hard as those first eight weeks of the spring uh, that they're in right now. Right now they're grinding. They're in, oh, they're, yeah. they're in a great Oh, time. they're in the middle of it right now. So it's yeah. been about, they're probably in week four, week five right now. Oh, yeah. It's heavy. It's heavy. <laughs> Clusters. <laughs> um, but, uh the yeah there's just like it's probably the one of the things that have I, my eyes have been open to the most and it's pretty much just through because unfortunately i have like the the group of people i would love to work with the most is like young athletes but i'm just not in right. the position to yeah. um so myself as an athlete i've basically been my own like guinea pig as far as like training volume and how much a body can really handle and like i will f I've been hurt three times in the last year, um, all, all my lower back because, uh, most of the time it's like, I'm just overtraining. I'm just like, I I'm doing too much and I'm not doing enough on the back end of that to like stay healthy. And that's what you start to run into with those athletes. And that's what you start to run into a lot when you get into the spring ball situations, camp situations, when you're piling on two hour plus practices, you have to be really, really careful and really, really intentional on the training side of things because their bodies are already overloaded. Like that's, that's intentional on the practice side of things. You can't then go and overload them in the weight room too, in the wrong way because, and you can still get strong without overload. Like this is like incorrectly overloading them, like not the specific training principle of overload, but like total volume of like stress and life and practice and school and, they have personal lives and now you're going to like run them into the ground in the weight room too. Like you just have to be able to manage that. 
anybody that heard he said he has a low back pain, don't instantly be like, oh, you need more hip internal rotation. I don't think I've ever seen anybody do an overhead squat. Yeah. Like you could have Kluver do the overhead squat as your example on the FMS, and it's like, yep, that's how it should look. Like, yeah, yeah, I that's true. It's still true. It's <laughs> it's gotten a little bit worse just with like. <laughs> You know, I'm not as bendy, but I'm like 99% as bendy. Like I can, it's my one party trick is like, if I put a barbell in my hands, I can hold it here and just oh, go, yeah. I can just go straight up and down. I just, my, my shoulder mobility is through the roof. It's the only good thing I have. Yeah. <laughs> you talked about starting your own businesses and training people. Like, so you've got, I mean, two things going on. How did you start that? Because you had the exercise science background and now you yep. got the entrepreneurial spirit. Our listeners yep. out there are trying to earn extra income and they want to start doing things of that nature. So how did you do it? Like, how did it happen? Yeah. Uh, it's funny because it was... I'm, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Everybody, we've said this before. None of this is financial advice. Do your own damn research. We're just talking things here, people. So nothing he says. You're taking right. They wouldn't take this at advice anyway. <laughs> um, so I come out of college and... Um, and I like I'm gonna I gotta make a career of this fitness thing. Like somehow, some way, I'm gonna be coaching and I'm gonna be making money. I don't know what exactly that looks like, um, but you know, I get into those jobs I had mentioned. I'm kind of like volunteer coaching eight hours a week. I'm working at another gym like 25 hours a week. Um, for a while, I actually, for like most of my hours weekly, I was managing a kids ninja warrior gym. Um, ninja, you. No, it was called okay, kids. There's one right near us. That's one. Yeah, it was, it was called kids warrior gym. Um, it's not there anymore just to like make money enough so that in the afternoons I could go coach like two or three classes at the CrossFit gym. And, uh, and I got, and then eventually I wasn't making enough money from that. And so I went and got a full-time coaching job, full-time being about like 32 hours at a, a place called elite edge. It's just like a, I do my jujitsu there. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So I was coaching at Elite Edge, $16 an hour or something like that, 32 hours a week. I mean, we're talking, <laughs> you know, like every other coach is like, yeah, I know what you're, yep, I know how that goes. Uh, but I'm coaching like full time. Yeah. And because it was only 32 hours a week, I had, you know, from college, I was a long snapper. So I'm, you know, I'm putting out feelers like, Hey, any long snappers in the area, high schoolers, anybody in college want to work, like do some training sessions. Like that's something I can make money with. So I was doing lessons there. Those are a lot better. Uh, $60 an hour, $70 an hour. It's a lot better than the coaching. Yeah. And fortunately, um, some for some reason or other people started following me on Twitter uh because of the the Hawkeye thing and that platform and me and a couple of buddies that I mentioned already uh were being funny on there and kind of gaining a following and decided to start our own podcast not as a business venture but just as like for fun that was one year out from when we played so 2017 was our last season about sep late September of 2018 was the first episode of our of our podcast okay. um just for fun didn't even know you could make money podcasting. Didn't even really understand it. I had only been listening to podcasts for maybe 18 months at that point. Like the Pat McAfee show and like Joe Rogan. That was it. Uh, but I'm smart enough tech-wise to like realize like, ah, I could figure out microphones and a recording software and like a way to put it together. And like 5,000 Hawkeye fans on Twitter had followed us th at this time and said, yeah, you guys should do a podcast and like review the games and all this stuff. So we started it. Podcast starts... We go that direction uh, again, 2018 that quickly blows up into just because of like the platform, it became financially viable, like almost immediately. Like I'm talking by episode three, we're getting 5,000 downloads per episode for like in the first week that an episode comes out and it's been that steady plus low growth, like five, 10, 15% growth year over year for like the past four, well, I guess 2018. So this will be year six uh, that we're in right now. So that helped because it being immediately uh, financially viable through advertisements and just the amount of downloads we had gave me a small amount of income. It still took me a while to figure out how to actually make money from that. But within, within about a year, we were bringing in like 
I don't know, $1,000 a month, $1,200 a month on podcast revenue. And that was just enough to combine with the Ninja Warrior Gym salary to like allow me to kind of have some flexibility and like, yeah, I work for myself kind of a little bit, you know? <laughs> Long story short, I end up at that Elite Edge Gym. I get fired right before COVID hit. Oh, uh, I was the newest guy in the totem pole. I, uh, there's no cool like sexual harassment story of like, <laughs> you know, me like touching somebody in the bath. Like, there's You're like, yeah. hey, want to see my party trick? Yeah, no, no juicy stuff like that. Like, I was just the lowest guy in the totem pole. I'd been there for seven months, and the gym was not doing as well as they wanted, so they just they cut the bottom the bottom guy. Happened to be me, and it was like a week before I was going on a vacation uh, to Mexico with my wife's family. And so I gave myself a week to be like, all right, we'll just enjoy this week. After vacation, we'll come back. We'll figure it out. Taking a quick break from the show to talk to you about our membership site. If you find value from our podcast, you are guaranteed to find more value inside of the Strength Coach Network video library inside the membership. Doesn't matter the level coach you are, you can see all of our 170 plus lectures sorted three different ways. Based on the level of expertise coach you are, aspiring, established, or head, you can sort it by every sport imaginable, and you can sort it by every topic in strength and conditioning. This makes all of the content consumable easy for you and for your staff members to be able to deep dive on any topic in strength and conditioning. Click the link down below to try the site out for 24 hours for only $1. Then your membership turns into a monthly membership where the price is less than $30 a month for $29.99, which is less than going out to dinner by yourself. You have access to all of this content. Click the link down below. I've got the podcast going. It's making a thousand bucks a month. So I'm not like dead, dead, dead broke. You know, my wife's a teacher, so we've got a salary there and I've got this and I can, I'll, I'll, I'll teach snapping lessons. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll train kids out of the garage, you know, like whatever. And my mind starts racing over those two weeks of like trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And I come out, I'm like, I've got five, six, 7,000 Twitter followers. Like, I wonder if these people would like exercise plans or, or like if these people would want to do like a fitness challenge. So I put out a fitness challenge the day that we leave for Mexico, 70 bucks to enter. It's going to be a 30 day challenge. It's going to also be based on, um, intermittent fasting because I had done some intermittent fasting to get, to lose some of that weight after training for pro day, a hundred people sign up $7,000 in my bank account in one day. You were probably just so freaking jacked up. And I was like, I've done it. I know everything. <laughs> I am Jeff Bezos. <laughs> I'm self-employed now. And I make that as, it's funny because I exaggerate that and that's hyperbole. But at the same time, it literally has been the case. Since that day, I ran a couple more challenges that did similarly well, uh, four or $5,000 a piece that year. It was the year of COVID. Uh, so in 2020, perfect timing because people were at home, didn't have anything to do. Let's screw yeah, it. We'll COVID do COVID money. Yeah, and COVID money, we'll do a fitness challenge. So it also coincided with, we had been consistent with the podcast and that's a big theme here with the, my two businesses is the fact that you, like, you just show up and you just do it every day. And you just keep doing it. If it's something you really believe in and you like and you're, you you want to make work, you just keep putting in the in the work even if you don't see it. It's that break the rock mentality actually. Yep. That late summer of 2020, I've done a couple – I've done two challenges at this point, made like 12 grand, and the podcast gets picked up by a like a semi-big network. And so we're now making like 1500 2000 a month off the podcast. And so between – and we've also started selling merchandise at this time. We started a Patreon at this time. So the podcast income had grown from like 10 grand a year to now it's like upwards of like 30 grand a year. And I can actually take from that. Like I can work with that, especially if I do this fitness stuff. And I told my wife late summer of 2020, I think I'm just going to like try this. Like I think I'm just going to try and do this thing between the podcast and the challenges and like trying to get like one-on-one -on -one personal training clients, like remote coaching. I'm just going to do this myself and like, I'm going to take a chance and it's now 2024 and we're still ripping. So, <laughs> you know, 
both of those things have grown since then. I've learned a lot since then. Uh, the, the income has stabilized since then, but it's just like, yeah, I mean, I, I now have like a roster. It's small right now. Uh, but I have a, like a, a client list or load of like seven or eight one-on-one remote clients that I check in with weekly f- for nutrition goals. And I write their exercise programming. Um, still do challenges from time to time, but that's really the majority of it. I put out some like daily programming, 30 minutes at home that people subscribe to. I make a few bucks off that each month. Um, but most of the, the podcast has really grown the most. The, the, I mean, that show the last couple years has done like, I think over just over a hundred grand in revenue, uh, in, in 22 and 23. And that's just a combination of like Patreon subscriptions where we do extra content, the actual advertising and sponsorships of the show, and then merchandise that we sell. Those three arms of the business all, com- all combined have done like s- six figures for two years in a row. And so I've, we've built it to a spot where I can take a, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not Jeff Bezos. I'm not making a, a big salary, but I, I make a salary between that and coaching. And that's, that's how my two businesses sort of operate. <clears throat> Anybody listening to that is there. I mean, hearing you just take in the reps, like that's what you got to do. But I think something that they probably heard was got picked up by a network. What does that even mean? Yeah. So essentially that's just in regards to your advertising and sponsorship. So gotcha. um, before that, we were just posting the podcast on uh, this website called Anchor at the time. Now it's Spotify for podcasters, I think they call it. And that they had their own monetization feature where they did deals on the back end with like Spotify or other companies that wanted to put their ads on what random podcasts. And, uh, and then they had a way to track analytics. And so, so many downloads made you so much money. And that's how we were making money initially. Huh. Over time, when you put in those reps and you show that you're a consistent show and you constantly show up and you have a decent following and our, you know, our socials have good following this network called blue wire, which is just a sports podcast network came along and was like, Hey, we'd like to pick you up as part of our network. And because of that, we'll do 50, 50 on the ad split. The benefit for you is you don't have to sell any of your advertising. You don't have to do any of that. We'll do all of that. We're going to take 50%. But we're going to sell your show out as much as we can, and you get the fifty percent cut, basically just for being on the network. You're like, sure. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's great. That sounds awesome. Um, and then even more so, a year later, we had grown even more, and in 2021, yeah, in the, like a year later, basically after signing that contract, a one year deal. When that one year deal was up, uh, iHeart contacted us. A um, couple contacts that work for like the regional iHeart um, department, I guess, or they have uh, regional titles out of Cedar Rapids, and they picked us up and were like, "Hey, we want to put you on the iHeart Radio Network," which obviously gives you a ton of exposure, and they do a ton of radio advertising too because they're connected with the radio station. Um, and uh, same thing, like they sell our they sell ads for our show they fill those ad slots and then we make a cut of that so that's basically what <clears throat> network means in college right now there are actually some strength coaches there's a i went on a coach's show who is in undergrad and they have a studio on campus so that way coaches can start to practice doing this so like that's why i'm asking you these questions because some of our listeners out there like this is a reality for them so you probably just gave them a little bit of light at the end of that tunnel you know what i mean yeah i think it's funny because like you'll see on Twitter like clips, outrageous clips that get like a lot of play and people are like, man, everybody has a podcast nowadays. Like we need to we need to like cancel how easy it is for people to have their own podcast because when they see like dumb opinions from people. And I think it's funny because podcasts were like this really novel thing. It was like you had to know how to do it. You had to buy the equipment. And now it's gotten so much easier. Like the industry of podcasting has blown up in the last five years, 10 years. And I view podcasts as just like an extension of your social presence. Like Mm. I have a Twitter, I have an Instagram, we have a YouTube channel, we have a podcast. Like that's just, it's just one of those things. I, that's how I see it. Like, I feel like everybody will have a podcast someday. Maybe not, 
maybe not, but it, more and more people, it, 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 it is shifting from this, like before, if you had a podcast, it's like, Oh, you have like your own show. You yeah. have your own radio show. Like that's, that's like very professional to where it's way more accessible now, like starting a Twitter account or an Instagram. And it's just an extension of your social presence, basically. <clears throat> Good point. Switching gears to the time that you were there at Iowa. I mean, you were around for probably arguably some of the, I mean, because I was there too. So I, I selfishly think like we were around for probably one of the most historic parts of Iowa football, especially considering, you know, 2014 not being a good season, 2015 kind of being the catalyst with slight edge, kind of bringing it back to um, break the rock. Have you ever like taken a step back and just realized the number of NFL players that were around from, you know, 14, 15 to yeah. when you left in 18? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Not just the ones that I played with, but like that we played against too. Oh, like, that's a good point. I didn't even think about that. Um, like I flip on, it's so casual and I don't even think about it this way, but like if you do take that step back, even to this day, I would bet money that any game on any Sunday has a guy that I either played with or played against when I was at Iowa. Every oh. single NFL game. Likely both teams playing in the game have somebody that I played with or against. And so, yeah, it's cool because I still see, see myself as like this, just, just this average dude. You're still, you're just like one year graduated, right? It feels like it. That's how I feel. I feel that. Yeah. And, uh, but then like the, the height of the sport, like the best athletes in the world are running around and I'm like, yeah, I tackled him once. <laughs> um, who was it? The, uh, <laughs> It was like, uh, I forget who it was, but it, it's like Saquon or... Jabril or, Peppers or somebody? Jabril. Or every like, time I see Saquon, Jabril, or Christian McCaffrey running around, I was like, yeah, I mean, I, ta I did tackle. I touched him. I, I like, cut, touched his jersey. Touched all three of those guys. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's wild, the amount of the amount of talent and, and people that came out of there. It wasn't, I mean, it's probably like a... Uh, the way that we all think we're the center of the universe, like the world revolves around us kind of thing. But like, it was a very interesting time, the years that we happened to be there. So, um, and a lot happened. Obviously the 2015 season was probably the highlight of that, uh, right in the middle of my career too, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Yep. Um, yeah, we were there the exact same time together. Yeah. F uh, four bowl games in a row that we just, could not get over the hump. And then finally that pinstripe bowl, we Dude, won. It was like, we won the super bowl. It felt like it. It really did. Yeah. It felt like it. And it wasn't, it wasn't, the, it wasn't even happiness of, wow, we won the pinstripe bowl against seven and five Boston college. It was, it was the fact that like we got to the postseason and we finally won we a finally freaking won. game. Yeah. Because you remember that LSU game in 13 when it was like, it was a 21 to 14, but you want to talk about names. Odell Beckham, like yeah, OBJ, Jarvis Landry, Mettenberger was an unreal quarterback that year. He never did really anything in the league, but um, a couple guys from their D line, uh, yeah, I mean, just name them off. It, just bowl games we played against. Then we went and played Tennessee in fourteen. Josh Dobbs, Josh Alvin, Dobbs. Alvin yeah. Kamara, um, yeah, Kamara oh, was. I forgot, on. I forgot Alvin Kamara was on that team too. Fifteen, we played against Michigan State in the Big Ten Championship, and then obviously CMAC at uh, Stanford in the in the Rose Bowl. Sixteen, we played a Florida team that was absolutely stacked. Yep. Um, Townsend, the punter for the Chiefs, I'm pretty sure was the punter for Florida that year, and uh, and then in seventeen we played the. Uh, guy who's built like a building who's the running back for the Packers now. I can't remember his name. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't think of his name either. He's like he was two, unbelievable. He's like 260 as a running back, and his quads are like the size of a tree. Um, yeah, I mean, we just played talent all over the field. It was nuts. Uh, you brought up, when you were just talking about 16 and Florida, that made me think about the fact that like we were able to get there because of beating Michigan. What was going through your head? Because you had the game-winning snap, not the hold, not the kick, but, like, what goes through a long snapper's head in terms of, like, before a snap like that? Or you got to get a punt off. Like, how nerve-wracking is that, and how do you prepare for it? Do you cuss on the show? Oh, hell yeah. We're an expert. Yeah, come on up. Okay. Because legitimately went through – legitimately went, went, went through my head as we stood there because there was a little bit of time when we were on the field before we – 
uh, hit that kick was, I really hope I don't fuck this one up. <laughs> like I, I like I, there might be a lot of people out there who are like athletes in big spots who are just like, yeah, I got this. No problem. No, like I was out there. It was nighttime in Kinnick. We were about to kick a field goal through the post to beat the number two team in the country. And the one thought going through my head down to my fingertips was hope I don't fuck this one up. Yeah. That's exactly what went, what went through my head. Now <clears throat> that's um maybe not a good thing to think for a lot of guys. Uh, I did find it very cool and like a, an honor to like every time I was on the field, the ball was in my hands. Like that's, yeah. that was a cool thing. Um, nobody can say that really other than like the center, the long snapper and the quarterback, yeah. like the balls in your hands on every play. Uh, and so that was a lot of, you know, the long snapper notoriously is like, has the most easy opportunity to mess things up. Yes. High stress. Uh, without ever getting praise when you do exactly Ever. your job, right? At least the kickers and punters get praise. I mean, Tori is an all-star at Iowa. Keith Duncan got praise all the time. Oh yeah. Like you mentioned their name and it's in royalty. Right. But like the long snapper, I throw a bullet back there right on the hip and they're just like, cool. You did what you were supposed to. It's like, okay, well that's not as easy so as the kicker. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, so, you know, that was, uh, obviously that Michigan game was unbelievable. It was the top three game that we, I played in obviously the Ohio state upset and 17 was great. There's a few other great ones. Um, but yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, but again, you go, you know, I was a third year starter at that point, fourth year player. I was pretty confident in my ability. I had snapped thousands of footballs before, as I was saying before, like a lot of people, specialists might like get that in their head, like, Oh, don't mess up. And that might actually affect them. I was pretty good at like using the comedy of that thought of like, yeah, I'm standing out here. I'm about to be the one who snaps this thing in front of, I think uh, the TV ratings that night were like 3.1 million people or something. Watch that happen. Like I'm just snapping this in front of millions. And if I wanted to, I could throw it 40 yards over his head. And this would be <laughs> national news. <laughs> and, uh, but I was like, you know, it's like, it's, you've done it a million times, like shooting a free throw. And like it, at the division one level, like if you, if a single thought like that makes you actually mess up your rep, then you probably shouldn't be in that position. So, um, Amen. quick break from the show to remind you to hit that like and subscribe button. So that way you get notifications of when more content like this gets released. So, Click that like and subscribe button. And with that, let's get back to the show. What about any of the punt rules? So I, I remember for us, you know, watching film on whatever days it was with Seth and changing the formations and now getting down to a little bit of the brass tactics, S and C wise for any of our coaches that work in football, yeah. you are not allowed as a long snapper to be covered. Does yeah. that, is that still the case? And if so, how would you change anything in terms of like speed work? Like for what we did, we just did a bunch of like 60 yard sprints. So that way you could just get down there and make the guy fair catch the kick. But yeah. is that still the rule? And then what would be any recommendations in uh sprint training for long snappers? So oh, dude, I would do so much differently than we did at Iowa. Um, for specialists, particularly yeah. like, why am I running four quarters? Right. I know. Like, let's talk about that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I get it, but I, but it's unnecessary. But I still want to know why am I running yeah. four quarters? <laughs> and I asked several times. Uh, I never got an answer. The, so rule wise on punts, you're, you cannot line up directly over their head. It gets a, really blurred because as long as you're a couple inches offset, they pretty much allow it. And then the rule is, you can't hit the guy until his head is up, right? So essentially like a one count. This happens all the time uh, anyway, and it never gets thrown. Um, but most of the time, relative to like strength conditioning for a long snapper, um, these guys aren't blocking. Like they're not blocking anybody. So not anymore. So – Strength conditioning wise, I do think the sprints are fine. Like the fifty fives we used to run, those are fine. The the linear speed work that we used to do, that's all good stuff. Um, 
I don't think necessarily you need any more of that. What I was getting at more so with the stuff that we used to do was I do think that for some reason uh, the specialists just – we just were involved way too much with conditioning that didn't matter. And what that does is it – body-wise in the off season, it takes away from your ability to then go do what matters. Is right? it that so, hard? Because I'm not good at kicking. Like, and I'm not going to try to act like I, I – So mean, DeMarco, again, is a freak who could kick a 60-yard yeah, field goal. Yeah, he's stupid. But, like – is it that hard to kick a ball, punt a ball when your legs are tired from lifting or running? Yeah. Like, what's the big difference? The difference is it is not that it's hard, but at that level, you're trying to be so good. You're yeah. trying to be so dialed in, right? And now you take into account the central nervous system effect of four quarters. I mean, or even 12, just a big 60 yard shuttle. 12, yeah. 60, 60s in stations out in the 90 degree heat. And then you want us to come back later for a skills and drills. And you want me to be like neuro, like neurologically, you want me to be dialed in yeah. like the amount of fine motor stuff that gets affected through heavy overstimulation of the central nervous system is unbelievable. Like, so the, the timing of the leg swing or the timing of when that ball comes off my fingertips, it's little stuff like that, that people, nobody, no one would ever think about that stuff until you do it. And does it really make a difference? Are you now going to throw it over a guy's head at that skills and drills later in the day because you're so tired from earlier? No, but there's a chance that none of those reps you do are really like an A ball, like a quality rep. There's a chance you get nothing out of that. For the kickers and punters, it's even more of a, a factor because that, that conditioning was all done with their legs. Yeah. And now there's – think about the amount of um, hip, flex, hip flexor activation that they're doing – in sprints or sled pushes and all this different stuff. And now they're, they, they have to come in and use that thing to absolutely pipe balls down the field. Like they're diminished. There's diminished quality of reps. And so it's just like the amount of conditioning. The one thing I would change full stop would be like, he's got, we need to be conditioned. And the reason we did it was because it was a team thing. Everybody does the same stuff. You all complete this, the work. You all grind together, all, all of that. But there were other ways to do that where, like, the specialists probably didn't need to run four quarters at the end of the summer to, like, prove that they were good to go out there on the field. I just made them do the same stuff on the bike, though. It would be like, hey, hop on the Airdyne and just sprint, like, sprint hard on the bike while everybody else was. It's a uh, little – that's even a little better, but, like – it, it sounds so soft too, because I'm, I'm like that guy too. It's like, I'll call people soft. I'll like make jokes, like just because that was beat into me. And I think it's funny, but like, if we're going to look at it intellectually, what does this kicker and punter need to go out there and do the best? They so probably nice. need to not run 24 sprint reps, <laughs> like during the middle, like four days a week in the summer. So, like they don't need to be. Like no. they they don't need any of it. They need none of it. They they need zero conditioning. None. We didn't. I didn't condi Like seriously, I didn't condition them. We would, we would have them do uh, stuff on the bike just to be like a healthy human being, like aerobic system wise. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of the time, once we got to our conditioning, our kickers and punters, because I couldn't have a football outside, they would just kick on air to prepare their legs. Yeah. Or they would go take footballs and go to the other field. Right. Like I would almost rather them do like mobility. Like I, like I swear, like I would rather while it, while the team goes and completes a a, a strength conditioning or a conditioning session, like they're gonna go run like twelve fifty five or fifteen fifty five or something. I would rather the specialists like go do yoga or like do FRC, yeah, 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 like like get like open up your hips, like stretch your hamstrings. Like I, I told I told our long snapper, I said, listen, bro, even if you have to do two reps in a row it's because somebody did something wrong and the referee is going to throw a flag. If you can't be recovered for the next rep, yeah. you suck. And like, those do suck, by the way. Those do yeah. suck. There's some, there's some mimicking in practice when you're in a, like a punt period when you have to do like back-to-back -back reps. I've, there, was a, there was a spring early on where I was the only long snapper and I would cover for 40 yards and then I would sprint back to the 
they would wait for me to sprint back so that the second group could go. And I would do like 12 or 14 reps in a row and run. That thir- is just lactic bath getting you. Ready oh yeah. For, for uh, then imagine your now imagine you're bent, you're bent over. Bent and you're trying, over. <sighs> well, you are. Yeah, no, seriously. That's what I'm saying. Like that sounds awful. And you're just cut off. Nothing is clearing from your, from your lower body. It's just like complete, complete lactic burning. And you're just like, okay, and now I'm supposed to snap footballs like this. I can't even <laughs> think straight. Like it's a lot that people don't understand. And it, it, you get it, but most people would be like, it's not that hard, bro. Like, it's not. Like, it so says, I have I have a, the great KF story, and then I'll let you go about the rest of your day. So I'm at this clinic last weekend, and I saw that Coach Ferentz was speaking too. So we catch up in the room where um, the speakers can, like, get drinks or whatever. And, like, we're catching up. He's like, oh, I didn't know you were going to be here. I didn't know you are living back in Iowa. So other people are obviously talking to him. And then – He's on stage getting ready for his talk, and there's somebody up there with him, but nobody traveled with him. Like, Bob didn't travel, Ben, nobody. So I just walk up onto the stage before his talk, and I'm like, hey, do you need help with anything? And he's like, actually, I do. Like, for some reason, the projector, the HDMI cord wasn't working, and then the clicker that Bob gave him wasn't working. And so (laughs) he texts Bob. He's like, now we're at the point where, like, he needs to start presenting. So he's like, hey, here's my phone. So he calls Bob. I'm talking to Bob as Coach Ferentz is on stage trying, like, getting his presentation. I turn it to FaceTime. I'm like, Bob, this is what the screen looks like. He goes, can you restart his computer? I'm like, Bob, he's on stage right now. Like, I don't know what to tell you. So we got it to work, and I had to just – I sat in a chair behind Coach Ferentz's um, laptop, and I'm hitting advanced slide for him during his presentation. Like, <laughs> oh my God, that's unbelievable. I can just imagine him going, oh shit, this thing doesn't work. <laughs> Gave me the wrong fucking clicker on it. Unbelievable. Yeah. And best part too, Jordan Kanziri was there because it was, oh, the, really? it was in Pittsburgh and Jordan is, Jordan's the head coach at his old high school. Yeah. Troy high school. Because he was the OC and then the head coach left and he was like, sure, I'll do it. Yeah. And yeah, so like I'm trying to, luckily Bob was like, okay, you can advance the slides with the up, down, you have to hit the left and right on the videos. It's like, all right, looks that's, like we're just going to make this thing work. That's unreal. <laughs> that's unreal. Yes. But true to KF form, right? Anybody that's listening, like, I mean, he's just an, he's like unbelievable guy, like plays off like nothing. He's like, Hey, yeah, you know, like, yeah, boom, he's just, a pro dude. Like he doesn't need anything to present. No. Like he could just stand up there and people are going to, yeah, he's that's that doesn't surprise me at all no that's kf for the course but that was my like unbelievable like wow catching up with like hadn't i hadn't seen him since 2018 when i was in his office crying like an infant because i had to leave iowa to go to townsend and it's like oh hey how you been (laughs) yeah i feel you on that one leaving iowa stuff yep no it's the greatest state anybody will ever come and visit and uh speaking of that we were going to be hosting an event in 2025 um, going to be called Summer Smart, a little bit of play on Summer Strong. So it's going to be in central Iowa, brother. We're going to have a lineup of coaches from Iowa State, Iowa, UNI, the high school level, um, private sector, like wow. CrossFit. We're gonna, hey, we could, we're going to have, we're going to be bringing people in. Uh, we're in the process of talking with Powerlift about making it happen wow. at their location. So they have a location in Iowa? Jefferson, Iowa's home base, brother. That's where everything gets made. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. I got to get them as like a sponsor of the podcast so I can get like new equipment for the garage. (laughs) I lift on, I'm about to go lift, right? Like, I mean, yeah, I'm about to go lift after this. And like, I'm just using like PV, like not even, I'm I'm using like two by fours in cement inside of, have you ever seen it? No. I'll send you a link. Uh, That's awesome. I literally built a squat rack out of two by fours and like cement in five gallon buckets. Yeah. So that's the the guy that owns strength coach network before Kier, his friend, uh, Tony, that's what they did during COVID. They, they put it in uh, Kier's old apartment. So that's what I squat out of. So I, I, like I pull, I jerk from there. Like I'm setting them back in like, so they don't fall over. (laughs) Yeah. Well, great. we'll let you get your lift in, brother. It's been over an hour. I appreciate you sharing with us. And of course. Uh, we'll link to everything washed on walk-ups below. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it, brother. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. 
Why don't you celebrate by watching more videos just like it? You can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you.